Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where we get to answer your questions. So if you're sat at home and you feel you've got a good question that you want answered, get in the comments with the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and hopefully we can feature it on the show. The first question is from Domain X and they say, how do you know what size spokes you need when building up a wheel? Is there a way to calculate it? Well, yes, there totally is. So um, there are kind of two ways to approach this. There are online spoke calculators or the kind of tried and tested, what I refer to as the pirate map, and I'll kind of explain both. Online spoke calculators are great. They can make the job very simple, but when they are, how to put it, an open, an open source one, I think you'd term it, where it's all done off user uploads and user dimensions, I don't trust them. If you're using one of those, be sure to measure your hub and rim thoroughly and input that information. If you're using something like, you know, DT Swiss's own, then I would trust the information. Um, but yeah, just if you're using one of the open source ones, they can sometimes kick out errors. Um, for the pirate map, as I call it, it's basically a big poster that you can kind of, you know, you measure up, you measure up your, all the elements of the wheel and it has very clear instructions which talks you through the process. If you're using an online spoke calculator, um, a few tips, use some vernier calipers. You want to measure, you know, all of it's quite simple, the, the flange distance between that and the, um, the outer end caps. The one that sometimes people get wrong is the distance. I think it's the flange hole diameter, you'd probably call it. Um, and so if you go from the bottom of each hole or from the top of each hole, then you're gonna get a really consistent measurement. Sometimes people go from the top and the bottom, but you ideally want to measure from the center of both of those holes. So when you're measuring those, those hub flanges and the distance between the holes, just go top and top or bottom and bottom to get a nice accurate reading. The other thing you factor in is ERD, effective rim diameter. Yeah, again, if it prints it on the rim, that's a pretty good go for, but um, you know, don't trust other people's uploads because uh, I just think it could um, could lead to a frustrating time when you build a wheel, you get to the final spoke and it won't screw in. Next question is from Kevin. And he, well, he has a burning question that he needs help with. Wow. So um, he says, brace yourself. It's about tubeless setup. Here's my problem. My rims are 19 mil internal and I ride 2.35 inch tires. If I went tubeless, wouldn't this give it a very high risk of burping? Well, that's his first question. Um, yeah, I remember when I used to run rims such as this, even just a few years ago, and I would be, you know, herped a burping all of the time. And it was a constant pain, especially in like, you know, those high load turns and bike parks and stuff. It was, um, yeah, a bit of a nuisance. So yes, there is an issue with, uh, with that. And that is for me, the main drawback of tubeless, which leads nicely on to your next question. What's wrong with tubes? Um, you then kind of give a bit of a description about your riding style, etc. Um, you know, if you're saying, I don't puncture, I have a really good experience with tubes and they give me all the performance, you know, yields that I, I look for, then stick with them. You know, I'm not here to try, and <laughs> to try and convert you. I have no invested interest in converting you to tubeless. I think for me personally, it enables me to run at lower pressures. Sometimes in the wet, if I'm riding kind of natural trails, I'll go, you know, 21 PSI, which is crazy low. Um, I do run quite wide, wide internal um, rim diameter, admittedly. You know, every time I run tubes now, I've been on the tubeless hype since maybe 2013, so quite a long time. In the last six years it is, every time I've run tubes, I have punctured. And that's even running, you know, 25, 30 PSI, which I think anything above that, and it is subjective, but I feel anything above 30 PSI in a front tire is not in, it, in its good window, its good band of operation for the trails I ride. It's really personal. Whatever you ride is completely up to you. If you like tubes, stick with tubes, don't lose any sleep over it. But um, maybe when you're next thinking about a different set of wheels or going to something slightly wider, you can negate the chance of burping whilst also enabling you to run lower pressures in a tubeless system. So I hope that helps, even if it's in a very long format. Um, WTB do make a really cool chart about uh, rim diameter and tire width, which we're gonna put a link to in the description so you can do some light reading and uh, tune up on some homework. 
The next question is from Chump MTB, and he says, hi guys, if you buy a bike with say 460 mil reach with 800 millimeters in the bar width, and then you subsequently cut them down to 760, how much does that change the reach number? I'm assuming there's some special measurement and it isn't going to be 40 millimeters actual difference. Well, it's a very good question. Um, it's kind of complicated. The reach is based solely on a frame measurement. It doesn't take into account cockpit setup. I have heard that there is the ratio of one centimeter of reach equals two centimeters of bar, which would kind of make sense. Um, although that isn't something, I don't know how technical that is. It might be a general rule of thumb. Um, there are some companies like Norco now, which are saying, don't change your stem, change your bar width to fine tune that number. Because yeah, of course it changes where your center of gravity sits. Um, yeah, so in regards to your question, how much difference is it gonna make? It's not gonna make 40 millimeters difference in reach. I imagine it will give a feeling of about 20 millimeters roughly. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Next one is from Dylan and he says, why does the mountain bike industry use Presta valves? This is something we've talked about in the tech show recently. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons for it. Initially when rims were very narrow, they needed a narrow valve. Also, I think there is an element, you know, having worked in bike shops in the past and people always refer to them as, you know, the kind of the quality option, it's, it's a denotation of quality, um, having presser valves on there. They call them like racing valves or high pressure valves and that to a consumer might actually be quite like a valuable selling point if they're choosing between an entry level hardtail where one's got Schrader and one's got Presta. It's little things like that, which could, you know, for the bike company, add up to, um, to more bike sales. You know, some people really don't like them. Honestly, there's some stuff I really care about. I don't really care about valves. If my new bike came with Schrader, I'd live with it. Um, some people find they do kind of gunk up. Um, but I think if every, everybody was running Schrader, the increase in, in how common that was would probably lead to a different set of common problems. So um, there is reasons in their origins. Maybe there'll be a new system around in a couple of years. Who knows? The next question is from Nathan Keller. And he says, why do some wheels have offset spoke beds while others do not? So this is a bit of a kind of an okie dokie bike trend. It's come and it's gone and it's come and it's gone. Um, some people have stuck with it. Others have kind of moved away. When you build up a wheel, you want to take into a factor called dish. Now dish is essentially how centrally that rim sits within the frame. Now the hub flanges don't sit centrally because they have different spacing requirements due to a cassette and a disc. So what they do is they actually put different length spokes to bring that rim back into central alignment with the frame. That's what you normally get when you have a symmetrical rim. An asymmetrical rim, what it does is by moving the spoke holes to one side, it means you can use equal length spokes on both sides and build something without any dish. So that all the spokes are evenly tensioned and it's built um, with strength in mind. And they correct the dish, they account for the dish with by making this, the spoke holes off center. And that's all it is. It looks pretty peculiar, um, but you know, it seems to do a good job. Some people really stick with it and um, some people are big fans. I think it's a pretty cool idea. Good on him. Next question from Harrison Griffiths. And he says, how do I know what lacing pattern to use? Well, 99% of the time, three cross is the most common one. So it's called three cross rather simply because the spokes, the inbound and the outbound cross three times, initially very close and then further away. You do sometimes get two cross, which is, you see it every now and then, more often than not on original equipment, on OE spec wheels. Um, and then there is radial lacing. Radial lacing is very light, but it's not very strong and would probably struggle to stand up to the rigors of mountain biking. You do sometimes see radial lacing on road bikes, um, especially on the front when they don't have such demands um, that you would get you know, from kind of um, acceleration forces coming from the rider. But for mountain biking, three cross. For me, every time, um, it's the most reliable, it's your bread and butter. 
and uh, it's the one. It's how I always build my wheels. The next question is from Lens, and he says, I run a Fox DHX2 Performance Elite on my bike, and I have two questions about it. Can you change the valves which control the oil flow, rebound and compression adjustment from the Performance Elite to factory? Because he would like to do that to gain some adjustability. So the, um, often with your shocks, the more expensive shocks have very similar um, internals, or in this case, you know, the chassis of the shock is the same, but what you get when you spend more is more adjustment. So if you are a rider that has particular demands, sometimes you really do require it. Now, the expensive bit on these shocks is that main frame body is the, you know, it's called the X2 because it has two damping circuits. You're not gonna have to swap out any of those. It's almost just like, you know, I think it's called a poppet valve, the whole assembly, which you can just drop in. If you speak to your local suspension center, I'm sure they can do that. You'd have to rebuild the shock, but it's, it's relatively simple to do. Um, and the next question, the secondary question is, they want to know what they can do against top out. Um, well, if you were to have that adjustability, I would say top out, you can um, reduce it by increasing some high speed rebound. So high speed tends to be from, in terms of the compression, that's your really big hits that will kind of eat up all the travel. And in terms of rebound, it often comes back from those big hits because the spring is being compressed more, it extends back with more force. Um, and sometimes you can get that annoying top out. So yeah, that would be, you know, try dialing up some high speed rebound. Also try a thing called bracketing. Bracketing is where you just basically sit centrally within kind of all the settings. And then you just, you know, just kind of walk them each way, going just quite methodically through on quite a short one, maybe a minute long. And you can just find out where the happy ground is. And the best way to learn about stuff, I think, is just by doing it and kind of, then you actually have a quite an empirical knowledge set in there of, I know what high speed adjustment feels like because I've actually done it. Um, in regards to this shock in particular, I would say make sure the spring is preloaded correctly because sometimes that can contribute towards a top out. And there we have it. That is another week wrapped up for Ask GMBN Tech. Now, if you want to stay with the channel and more particularly stay with wheels, click down here for some basic theory and how to true a rim. And if you want to see Brendan Fairclough's beautiful Scott Gambler downhill bike, click down here. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. And we'll see you next time.